Um, and I'd like to start with um, a few images just to set the scene. So they'll come up on here in just a second. Okay, we'll stop there. I'd just like you to um, consider how you're feeling right now. Just examine that internal dialogue. Sad, guilty, bored, fed up. Is it all pointless anyway if China doesn't change? Do you just really like eating meat and you know that in a few minutes I'm going to tell you you should stop? Is this really only for people dressed in random hippie gear from Nepal? And anyway, why are we doing this in church? This series, we're looking at Christ and our culture. And this week in particular, as Adam already alluded to, with the COP26 talks going on, you will have been hard pressed to ignore the culture's increasing awareness of climate change. We are bombarded with images like those that I've just shown you. Most environmental messaging is deliberately emotive, and the key themes are fear and guilt. And that is not where we need to be as Christians. Now, I am convinced that God's heart for creation is bigger even than Greta Thunberg's. But as Ali reminded us last week, we need to engage with the culture as Jesus did, as Jesus does. And so we are stopping there, stepping away from the culture's messaging, and I'm going to restart this talk in Romans 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, 
you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Amen. So Paul opens this most magnificent of chapters with the stunning truth that there is no condemnation for anyone in Christ Jesus. Many climate groups rely on the opposite in their messaging. Condemnation for us if we don't send this email to our MP right now. Condemnation for Tesco's for not recycling more plastic. Condemnation for the Western world, for China, for industry, for apathy. It's wrong. Of course, there is evil in many of these things, but for anyone in Christ, the condemnation is gone. When we live according to the flesh, it leads to death in all parts of our lives, including our families, our communities, and ultimately the planet. We need to confront the ugly truth that our desires can be ugly and the consequences can be ugly. Living this way, Paul says, we cannot please God. But instead, we live according to the Spirit. Our response to the climate crisis, as to all things, is not one of guilt or fear. It is a response of freedom, the freedom to choose to live as beloved children of our Abba Father. And so, as his children, let's look together at how our Father feels about the environment in general and climate change in particular. I've chosen climate change because it's the biggest single challenge facing us, but the same principles would apply to any other environmental issue. Okay, so first we're gonna look at the direct teaching that Jesus gives us in the Gospels about the environment. So this is quite a short point. Jesus lived and taught in his time, and climate change was not really a first-century Palestinian problem. I'd like to point out that he didn't say much about Netflix either, but we do seem to be able to mention that in about half our sermons. So instead, we are going to need to look more broadly at what the Bible says about three interrelated issues. Creation and the glory of God. Poverty and the justice of God, priorities, and the worship of God. And in each case, we'll look at what we know of who God is and then what that means for us. Okay, so first, creation, the glory of God. You don't have to read much of the Bible to know that God is passionate about his creation. I think the most amazing passage, maybe, is from Paul's letter to the Colossians, As you hear these words, notice that when Paul wants to set out how incredible Jesus' glory is, he does so with reference to the whole of creation. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. This passion for creation runs throughout scripture. So Genesis starts by describing God's delight in his creation. It was good. It was good. It was very good. 
The Psalms celebrate man's response to the glory of what God has made. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Just one example. Psalm 104 shows how creation reveals God to us. It opens with the power and might of light, sky, clouds, and wind. It reflects on the authority of God as seen in the stability of creation. It recognizes the provision of God through grass, bread, oil, and wine. And then it turns to the dependability of God in the regular patterns of day and night, the year and the seasons. And at that point, the psalmist can't contain himself and bursts into praise. How many are your works, Lord? In wisdom you made them all. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. I will sing to the Lord all my life. Indeed, the whole creation itself sings to declare God's glory. You will go out with joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. And as Revelation itself makes clear, creation is not just declaring God's glory for now, for the time being. Heaven, the new creation, is a city, but a city with a river and trees and a whole bunch of beautiful minerals and precious stones, each of which is identified by name, which as a geologist makes me very happy. God delighted in his creation glory at the beginning. He does so now, and he will continue to do so forever. So what then is our mandate? Well, we are to steward the glory of God in creation. In the beginning, God tells humankind to fill the earth and subdue it, to have dominion. And the Hebrew word is radar, which might be pronounced differently to that. The same word is used of the great king in Psalm 72. He is to radar as he provides for the needy. So it's a rule of compassion and justice. In the Genesis 2 version of the creation story, man is to adab and shamar which is to serve, protect, guard, and keep. Adam and Eve are originally placed in a garden, which is somewhere designed, planted, crafted by God, and then entrusted to their care. That was never a license to exploit, extract, dump, slash, and burn. Now, after the fall... We're not in the garden anymore. And yet the mandate remains exactly the same. Work the ground, God says. That work has just got a whole lot harder, but we are still called to Rada, Adab, and Shamar. And that call is repeated again after the Exodus as the people enter the promised land. God says, For six years, sow your fields. For six years, plant your vineyards, and gather their crops. But in the seventh year, the land, not just the people, the land is to have a year of Sabbath rest. That's Leviticus 25, verses 3 to 4. I don't know if it's on there, sorry, Luke. What the land yields during its Sabbath is to be shared with all people and animals. And the animals include the livestock and the wild animals too. Even after the fall, repeatedly, God's heart is still for his whole creation. So what does that mean for us now? Three things. Firstly, we can be grateful for the provision of God, including fossil fuels, which have underpinned enormous improvements in life expectancy and quality of life. God's creation is good, and we do not have to vilify what he has given us. Secondly, we can live in hope. God remains committed to this earth. His mandate to Rada, Adab, and Shamar stands. So seeking sustainability is not hopeless. And thirdly, we can be environmentalists without buying into paganism. 
but because we are passionate about the glory of God in the creation that he crafted. In fact, I would say not just that we can be environmentalists, but that we must. If we are Jesus followers, but are not really into all this environment stuff, we need to recognize that we are ignoring repeated and direct commands from God. And we may need to repent of that. Remember, there is no condemnation, but there is freedom to choose to walk in step with the Spirit in line with the heart of the Father. So that was point one, creation and the glory of God. We now turn to point two, poverty and the justice of God. When I was 18, I was quite scared of the idea of going to university. However, I was totally fine about heading off to the other side of the world with people I'd never met, doing stuff I was totally unprepared for. I have no idea how that made sense in my head. But it meant I spent a year in India volunteering with a Christian charity. It was a life-changing year in many, many ways, including my understanding of the Bible. As we studied the scriptures in that context, with street kids hanging on our arms, with beggars covered in open sores, and with women scavenging every day on the rubbish dump, words that I'd read for years and years leapt off the page, and I realized just how strongly God is for the poor and against their oppressors. And that's another theme that runs right through the Bible. So some examples. God doesn't just call Israel for himself. He also brings judgment on the wicked nations who have mistreated the people and the land. God doesn't just give commands to love and follow him. His law is also about justice and protection for the vulnerable. God doesn't just send prophets when Israel go after false gods. He also speaks when they engage in corrupt business practices or when they marginalize and oppress foreigners or children or the poor. And Jesus. Jesus doesn't just appear, die on a cross, resurrect, and reascend. Look at who he hangs out with. Look at who he's kind to. Look at who he makes time for. Look at who he became. Jesus was an illegitimate son in a refugee family, largely homeless, persecuted by both the religious and the political elites, the victim of a rigged trial, unlawfully executed. That is who God identifies with. Now, humans are at the heart of God's care. Humans are the very good of creation. And most of the passages that I've just talked about are focused around justice for the poor, for people. But the Bible is not silent on justice for creation, for the earth itself as well. A staggering 2,700 years ago, Hosea said these words, hear the word of the Lord, you Israelites. Because the Lord has a charge to bring against you who live in the land. There is no faithfulness, no love, no acknowledgement of God in the land. There is only cursing, lying and murder, stealing and adultery. They break all bounds and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Because of this, the land dries up and all who live in it waste away. The beasts of the field, the birds of the sky, and the fish in the sea are swept away. And a verse many of us may know well from 2 Chronicles also talks explicitly about healing the land as well as the people. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and will heal their land. 
So what is our mandate? We are to fight for justice, for people, for ecosystems, and for the Earth itself. Climate change is fundamentally a justice issue. It disproportionately affects those with the least power, the fewest resources, the smallest voices, and the least ability to mitigate risk, who have made the least contribution to the problem in the first place. When the same hurricane hit Haiti and the Carolinas, 26 people died in the US. Haiti was flattened. The UN have stated climate change threatens to undo the last 50 years of progress in development, global health, and poverty reduction. Now, I could give lots more examples, but I just don't think there's any need. Once we're aware of injustice, the Bible is clear what God expects of us. Some of the passages are pretty stark. We came here this morning to worship, but are we offering the worship he desires? Isaiah 58 says this, Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen, to loose the chains of injustice, and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear, then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. The verse that really hit me back in the 90s in Mumbai was this one. Whoever oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker but whoever is kind to the needy honors God. Whoever oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker, but whoever is kind to the needy honors God. Whenever we're part of an oppressive system, we're showing contempt for God, contempt. That is not where I want to be. But in our interconnected world, everything we do has an impact on people whose suffering we often don't know much about. Surely every single one of us needs to repent and to seek to live in closer alignment with the God who rails against poverty and injustice. Remember, there is no condemnation. There is no condemnation. But there is the freedom to choose to walk in step with the Spirit and in line with the heart of the Father. So what do we do? <laughs> we'll look at some practical responses at the end, but let me suggest that we first just need to pause in seeking to be more like our good, good Father. Our first step may be simply to ask for his compassion to allow God to break our hearts for what breaks his, and to lament. Okay, so to recap, point one, creation and the glory of God. Point two, poverty and the justice of God. And finally, we're going to look at point three, which is priorities and the worship of God. Sometimes, particularly in church contexts, this talk of, climate, of the climate crisis can feel like a distraction from what really matters. We're Christians, after all. We understand that what the world needs most is Jesus, because only faith in Jesus can ultimately save, and that is absolutely true. But it doesn't mean we get to ignore everything else. 
the physical stuff matters. God's original creation and his new creation are made of stuff. Neither of them are just a load of souls. Our God invented the body and atoms and stars and the sea. And we need to value what he does. Throughout the Bible, God has engaged with the physical needs of his people. He sets slaves free. He provides food and water and clothes that don't wear out. He brings his people into a fruitful land. The early church cared practically for the vulnerable. James, Paul, Peter, John, they all exhort acts of love. But the focus isn't only on serving people, as if that wasn't hard enough, whether inside or outside the church. We started this talk in Romans 8, and later in that chapter, Paul explicitly picks up the idea of the brokenness of creation and the glory of its restoration in the future. He says this, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we eagerly wait for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies, for in this hope we were saved. God places the restoration of creation as a priority alongside our own redemption. And as always, when we look to Jesus, we see how it should all fit together. In the crucial hours on Good Friday and Easter Sunday, he died and was raised to life again for our salvation. And he also spent 30-odd years eating, sleeping, laughing, telling stories, hugging children, calling Zacchaeus down out of a tree. Jesus showed us what a truly human life looks like. Here's our mandate. It's a life to the full, engaging with all that he has made. It's a life of worship. This isn't a life of guilt. There is no condemnation. Our sins are forgiven, including our climate sins. It isn't a life of fear. Unchecked climate change is scary. But we're not meant to be engaging because we're afraid. We're empowered, literally, by God with the spirit of love, power, and a sound mind. Our life of worship is about loving God with all we are, heart, mind, soul, and strength. With our hearts, open to compassion and to the pain that God feels as he looks at his suffering world. With our minds, learning about the issues. We can't know everything, but we can take some time to find out a little bit more with our souls, so we pray. Sign up for newsletters from groups like Tear Fund for inspiration. And with our strength, practically doing something about it. Our life of worship is about doing everything we do to the glory of God. So we're going to have a look at a list of pro-climate actions But what I want this to be is a call to worship by thinking about some of those actions, not a call to guilt and fear and all of that stuff. So I'm going to pass these out. 
could you pass them along? There's tons of these. Now everybody's just going to read and not listen to the last paragraph. Years of being a teacher should have taught me not to do it that way. Like I said, this is an act of worship. Now, we don't all worship the same. Each of us will need to choose different challenges to respond to. Real worship contains some elements that are easy for us, that we can offer with joy, and hopefully there are some of those on there. Real worship also contains elements that are a challenge for us and that we offer as a sacrifice. And there'll be some of those on there too. And some things on there will just not be for us right now. And that is fine. But we can encourage other people in them. I'm going to put the same list on the screen, probably too small to read, um, and just invite us to spend a minute or two prayerfully now asking God where we could deepen our worship of him. It's really easy to feel quite overwhelmed by this stuff. So as we conclude, can I encourage you to bring your five loaves and two fish to Jesus? Our individual contributions are far too small to make a difference. But we offer them because it's worship and Jesus takes care of the results. Let me say it one more time. There is no condemnation. But there is the freedom to choose to walk in step with the Spirit and in line with the heart of the Father. It's really important to me that the environment isn't seen as a fringe issue for the more hippie members of the church. And so I've asked the less hippie Ali to share his response. Have you ever been called that before? To share his response to this content. Um, Partly as our church leader, sure, but also just simply as someone who seeks to follow Jesus in his own life. Uh, And I'd like to thank you, Ali, for being willing to be vulnerable and be put on the spot like this. At one point when I, when I planned the uh, preaching grace, I thought this was going to be a week off for me, but I've managed to end up being up here twice for the Ursula Lops today. But uh, thanks so much, Bob. That was, that was so, so good. I don't, know, I, don't know, I don't know how you found that. Um, 
I, I personally found it immensely challenging. Um, I've, I've read the notes previously, so it's the second time I've, I've, I've read slash heard it. Um, and I'm, I'm on a journey. We're probably all on a journey with this, with this stuff. Um, I definitely used to be in the camp of this is a periphery issue. This isn't really important. Let's not talk about it in church. Um, so met some of you may be in that place, and uh, maybe you still are, and that's, that's fine, you're entitled to your opinion, but that's not where we are as a church and as elders, and uh, certainly we're not where I am. Um, but I'm, 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 I would say I'm, I'm near the beginning of the journey, so it's, it's, it's not a distraction. It, this isn't a distraction. As Bob said, this is, this is part of cr- caring for creation. It's part of discipleship to Jesus. It's part of following Jesus. It's part of believing in a God who made and loves all things, and who came to redeem all things. And I just think that even that Colossians passage, I mean, it was all powerful, but that Colossians passage is just so powerful. Jesus came to redeem all things, all things. All, what are all things? It's all things. Uh, and <laughs> I think sometimes we, just this whole kind of spiritual, physical divide thing, um, I'm just reiterating, I mean, I'm not going to bring lots of new stuff here, but reiterating some of the stuff Bob said, this spiritual, physical divide is definitely something I've, uh, I've had to, uh, be changed by God on where we think all oh, the the important stuff is the spiritual stuff and the the, the physical bodily stuff whether that's human bodily or, or kind of physical physicality out there in, in in the natural world is less important but it's all important to God he's redeeming all things and uh, we're going to get new bodies in the new creation there is going to be a beautiful um, natural world around us and there's going to be continu- continuity as well as discontinuity with this present creation it's not like God's saying right uh, I've tried one one world. This world hasn't worked very well. I'll, I'll just I'll just go on to Plan B now. And it's, this is always the intention that this this present world would, uh, if you like, give birth to the to, to the new creation uh, where all things are made new and all corruption is gone. So if we reduce the gospel to Jesus came to die for my sins on a cross and take me to heaven, we have a very very small gospel. We don't have a biblical gospel. That's part of it, but it's only a part of it. Uh, Actually, the gospel is God came, Jesus came to redeem all things. It's a much bigger, grander, it's a whole creation gospel. Uh, Romans 8, just there it is, it's, it's there in black and white. He came to redeem all creation from its bondage to the gate that it's currently in. And so as a church, it's something we need to take seriously. Uh, and um, when we're in the beacon, um, obviously, um, in conversation with Hartwell, we can think about how we can do things there in a way which is caring for the world around us. Uh, I know there's great plans for the future in that, in terms of um, uh, reducing its carbon footprint and things like that. But um, individually, what are we going to do? Um, we must be motivated by worship of God. This is a worship thing. And uh, the headlines in the news this week, it's just like fear, 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 fear. And that is not, that is not the way we... This whole series, Christ and Culture, um, the reason we're doing it is because these are issues that we can and must engage the culture on. Um, and the environment's a great opportunity to point to Jesus because we have this huge overlap, as in maybe a lot of the practical outworkings that are on that list will think, okay, that's what people in the world are saying. But the huge difference is the motivation. And we have gospel motivation. We have Jesus motivation. So as we're talking to people, why not talk about your, t- with your friends at work, wherever you are? Say, how, how have you found this whole week with all this stuff about cl- climate change and the environment? And then how easy is that then to say, yeah, I'm, 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 it's, it's really been thought-provoking for me. And, but you can point to your hope in Jesus and how actually we're not living in fear. <laughs> Jesus is in, is in control of all this stuff. Just because he's in control, like all things, doesn't mean we, just, we sit around and do nothing. Uh, he's in control, but he also gives us a command to live that out for him. And so uh, just thinking that through, for me, one of the big things as well was the whole justice thing. Um, because God spoke to me many, many years ago about his heart for the poor. And I didn't join the dots because I'm thick. Uh, <laughs> between caring for the created world and the, and the effects that has on, 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 poor and on, on the poor. And uh, the fact that, you know, something which is easy for us, um, we think is a throwaway thing that we're not really thinking about it is having a knock-on effect uh, on some of the poorest in, in our world and God cares deeply for the poor and needy in our world. So we're at the start of a journey as a family, very, very uh, start of the journey, but 
Um, it has made me think more about things like reusing. How am I reusing things? How am I getting things secondhand rather than buying everything new? Um, I like to save money. And the great thing is about the environment is lots of the environmental choices you make also save you money. So again, in all honesty, a lot of the motivation in the past for turning the heating down a little bit, that's a discussion with Claire, but turning the heating down or for um, uh, having some more vegetarian meals, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not going down the, the, the fully veggie route unless God does something very significant in my heart, um, is, bec is, is because... Um, of, the, of the financial reason, but actually now the whole environmental is also a big thing in my thinking and why I do things. I, I attended an online conference um, earlier in the year uh, about the environment, the Christian conference, um, and again, it's, I did that deliberately, uh, not because we were doing this series, but because it's something that God is just, just stirring my heart on. I'm trying to gain more information. I've signed up to some uh, uh, prayer newsletters, those sorts of things. Um, I want to recommend a book. I meant to bring it and I forgot. It's called A Call to Act. Um, it's only got... Wow. I think I saved it in. If not, we'll talk about that later. Um, <laughs> that got your attention. Um, it's called A Call to Act. <laughs> and it's, um, it's by uh, Martin Charlesworth and Natalie Williams, who um, head up something called Jubilee Plus, which has come out of the New Frontiers movement, which Reasons Beyond has also come out of. So it's kind of, it's, I'm saying that not because they're great and I know them a little bit, uh, but also because sometimes you think, oh, this is sort of certain wing of the church who's into this sort of thing. Actually, the kind of church that we are in our DNA, um, this book's written, written by those, those guys. There's, only, there's one chapter on it about uh, creation care because um, it's all about different issues of, of poverty and justice and how we can act. But I really recommend it. A call to act. It's really practical. It's really helpful. Um, so you can borrow it from me if you would like to. You also can buy it yourself. I'm going to pray. Uh, Ian and Dan. It's Dan. And <laughs> I am very sorry. I'm going to pray. <laughs> yeah. We've just had a, a bit of quiet already. And... There's probably all sorts of stuff, like all these issues, as I've said before, and we're going to have um, a Zoom evening tonight uh, from 7.45 to 8.30, the normal Zoom if you want to join uh, in that. But there's probably all sorts of things you, you're thinking, maybe things you want to ask. But try now just to fix your minds. <laughs> well, hopefully they've already been fixed on Jesus, but just Jesus. Jesus. He is the firstborn over all creation. He is making all things new. This is all for Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's all because of Jesus. That's why we're having this kind of discussion. <laughs> Not because the news is telling us to, but because, but because Jesus is talking about it. And so, Lord Jesus, with all that's going on in the room right now, Lord, we just worship you. Lord, we say we're sorry, Lord, where we have maybe said this issue isn't a Jesus issue. And yet, Lord, we're, we want to realign our hearts with you where that needs to be challenged and corrected. Would you challenge and correct it? Correct it. And Lord, we choose to walk your way. Whatever that looks like for us practically, we say, come Holy Spirit. We're people who are led by the Spirit. And so we say, Holy Spirit, would you lead us in your ways on this? Would you give us wisdom, Lord, as we talk to our unbelieving friends, family members, work colleagues, Lord, would there be opportunities to point to the hope, the amazing hope that we have in the gospel? Even this week, Lord, we pray, make us proactive in that. Yeah. Come, Lord Jesus. And Lord, we pray for this world that you have made. We pray knowing that you are making all things new. One day you will return. You will establish the new heaven and the new earth. And we pray, Lord God, that right now, in all of the despair, in all of the chaos around the world, Lord, particularly, Lord, for those places that are, are being so dramatically affected by what's going on in, in, in creation, Lord God, we pray that your love, that your justice, that your hope would come through, would be known. And in all these things, Lord Jesus, we ask that you would get the glory. God of creation.
God of salvation. Be glorified. In Jesus' name. Amen.